What happened? What led you to the point for people who don't know Jasmine had some mental health stuff going on and made an attempt to unalive herself. And obviously she is awesome in here with us. So it failed. And yeah, there, there was obviously, I'm sure a lot that went into that. So we just want to hear kind of what was going on. What were you thinking? What led up to all this happening? So I was hearing things and I was seeing things that just weren't there. And it was frightening to be a 21 year old woman experiencing that stuff and not knowing what to do about it. So it led me to become super depressed and super anxious about everything. Everything was a trigger to me. Um, if I would talk to someone, I would get triggers. Um, and a lot of it came from just not having the right support system in my life. And then one night I knew that there was a gun in the house and I was hearing things. So I immediately thought that the only way to end this and end the things that I'm hearing is to take my life. So I took matters into my own hand and I grabbed a 45 and I put it under my chin and I shot it and after that experience I immediately stood up and I knew I wasn't going to die because I didn't feel any like exit point out of my body. So the bullet shell was lodged into my nose and the bullet went up in the ceiling. So I was very lucky enough and fortunate and blessed to not have any bullet go through my head. And uh, immediately after the gunshot went off, my boyfriend, Aiden, he ran into the room and he was just screaming like, Jasmine, Jasmine, no, like this is not okay. And he called the ambulance, the ambulance came, I walked myself down the stairs and then I was put into a two week coma, medically induced coma, so they could proceed to uh, perform surgeries and other things. When you came out of that whole thing and you were woke up in the hospital, what was your first thoughts? Like, were, were you mad that your plan didn't carry out? Was it hard for you, like pain wise? Like, what were you thinking? It was very painful because I had a trach in. So the trach, the trach was very like uncomfortable. And when they went to, when they went to suction it and get the mucus out of that trach, it would just hurt so bad. And I also have my jaw wired shut because I wanted to make sure that my jaw wasn't affected. So my jaw was wired shut for about six months. And I didn't have like a bottom jaw. So it was just like wires and then an open space that I would cover with, um, whatchamacallit, with gauzes. Oh, wow. Okay. When I woke up, I was happy and relieved that I was alive because as a 22, 21, 22 year old woman, it's not, something that's easy to take your life it's not an easy thing to do right and to do it and then have the blessing of being alive it just it meant everything to me that god gave me a second chance obviously you wanted the the voices and everything to stop but right after you pulled that trigger and you did stand up like were you just thinking that oh my gosh i'm still here what was going through your head I was like, oh my god, the gun went off. I can't believe that this really just happened. Um, I need help. The only thing I kept saying the whole night is, I need help. I need help. And the um, medics, they took me into the ambulance and they said, you're getting help. You're going to be okay. We're going to get you to the hospital. Don't worry. They gave me a shot of something in the car. I want to, not the car, the ambulance. I want to say it could have been morphine, but I could be wrong. But they wanted to stop all the pain that I was feeling. So they gave me something to stop the pain. But I was just in shock after the whole thing happened right growing up did you have mental health struggles from a child do you remember feeling different from other people or like you didn't belong yes uh i experienced a lot of bullying in high school i just didn't fit fit in and i wasn't getting the proper like love and support from other kids that i needed to grow up as a healthy woman so like being 22 years old, like I don't have a best friend that I can go and talk to because I didn't have friends growing up. So, and on top of things like that, I moved around a lot. So I was bouncing back and forth from school to school, state to state, and it just made it hard to adjust, but it wasn't hard adjusting. It was just a hard thing to adjust to a new state, a new city, new kids, new teachers. It was just overwhelming. But I did suffer from anxiety growing up because I went through some things that I won't mention, but I did suffer from anxiety and depression just because of the things I went through as a kid. And 
it slowly disappeared and I didn't think like think many things of it growing up and becoming an adolescent and becoming into my teenage years. But I did experience depression, anxiety as a kid. Where were your parents at like before all of this happened? Did, did they recognize the signs that like something was kind of off or did you hide it really well? They knew things were off um, because we talked. So they knew that I was going through a lot of things and it would make us butthead sometimes because they couldn't understand or figure out what was going on with me and they didn't know how to help me. So I'm just like, okay, if you can't help me, you can just leave me alone. And I would just push everyone that I knew away rather than like going to them and saying, okay, I actually do need help. So where do I start? But I just try to hide it from most people. I talk to my roommate Raheel a lot. Uh, Raheel is awesome. He is one of my best friends and I talk to him about a lot of things, but it was only so much I could tell him without it just hurting me more and causing more depression. Whenever everything happened, what was your boyfriend's first reaction? Obviously, he was in shock and didn't want that to happen. But was he instantly like kind of worried himself? Just did he feel bad like he was responsible? I want to say he did probably feel responsible because as a boyfriend, you're supposed to be there for your girlfriend and he didn't know how to help me and know the things that I was going through. So when the thing happened and the gun went off, he kind of went into like a survival mode and he just knew that my life was in danger and he needed to save me any way he could. So calling the ambulance was a first thought in his mind, like I need to get my girlfriend help immediately because if I don't, she could die. I don't know how, and not invasive, but I don't know how intrusive of these um, injuries were. So it's just, he went into survival mode and he was very scared and shocked. How long were you at the hospital for that? I know you've had multiple surgeries, but that yeah. initial hospitalization. I went in January 8th. I didn't get released until February 13th or the 16th. One of those days. So I was in there for about a month and a half, a month and two weeks. So if you're in there for mental health issues, is there a certain protocol that you have to meet certain criteria before being discharged to not be a threat yeah. to yourself? Yeah, I had to go through psychiatric care. Um, I was in there for about two and a half weeks um, where they ran tests on me. They talked to me. We did group counseling, group therapy. Um, we did one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, on when, when I was in the psychiatric facility, my medication bounced around a lot because they were trying to figure out what would work perfect for me to help me get through life without like harming myself again. So. When I first went in there, I was Baker acted and the only people that were allowed to see me were my parents and uh, my like sisters, brothers and my grandmother. So my boyfriend at the time, he couldn't even see me. And that was so detrimental to his health and his healing and his mindset because the love of your life is in danger and you don't know how to help her and you have no way of knowing what's going on with her because the hospital won't, won't tell you anything. Were your parents and everything talking to him? Because I mean, I, I guess if I was him, it would be like, you almost just want to hear it's not your fault and everything's okay. So was was there at least some contact to kind of help him? Yeah, we did talk. I did ask my parents to relay messages like, hey, can you tell Aiden that I'm okay and that things are going good and I'm going to be okay. And um, they relayed those messages and it got back to Aiden and I think that gave him some sort of peace of mind and it allowed him to sleep because he wasn't sleeping. It was a very scary night. Yeah, I would think so to say the least. When you were working through everything with like the psychiatrists and counselors and everything, did you feel like it was helping? Like did it solve the problem along with medication and did you figure out what was going on with the voices? I did. I found ways to like cancel them out and just ignore them rather than just like listening to them over and over again and like getting into a psychotic break kind of. Do you feel like the medicine quieted down your mind, like slowed things yeah. down? Very much so, very much so. It helps level me out, it helps bring things back to reality rather than having me thinking like something's wrong when there's actually nothing wrong. What diagnoses did they give you? Psychosis. What was the actual like injuries whenever you were first in there? What what happened with your jaw and everything? So my chin was completely gone that night and they had to 
do two life-saving surgeries to repair it and bring it back together. So they just kind of like took my jaw and put it together. I had stitches. Like if you see in my pictures that I posted on my on my uh, TikTok, you'll see like there was bone showing because they could only do so much in the surgeries. And whenever you went through all of those surgeries, like, cause you, you had like what, six or seven times that you had to go in? I want to say it's five because I just got the tissue expanders put in. Yep. So, um, we still have a lot more surgeries to go. Um, I know my next one will be getting the tissue expanders out and this shaved down. And then they'll do things with like the extra skin that they have from the tissue expanders. So they'll take that and cover the scarring that's going to come from shaving this down. So do they do skin grafts from another part of your body to help you with the skin? Yeah, so they're doing a skin graft here. So right here is my excision, right there. And what's inside is tissue expanders. And what we have to do is fill those out with saline. So they'll expand. And once they start to expand, the skin will start to stretch. Right. And making extra skin. That way they can use the skin that's closest to my face color and use it to cover any extensive scarring from this getting shaved down. I didn't even think about that too. Wow. You're trying to match color and like everything like that. That's yeah, there's a lot that goes into not only plastic surgery, but first it's life-saving and then it goes to aesthetics. Whenever you're getting all these surgeries, cause I'm sure it takes like, you have that recuperation time and all that. Have there been times where it's kind of brought you down again, just because you're you're tired of having to like heal, I guess? Yeah, there's a lot of times. I know when I have my big surgery, when I had my reconstructive surgery, I was very down and um, the whole time while I was in the hospital trying to recover from the surgery that I just had, I was hearing things and I just wasn't feeling the best and it was just causing me to become really depressed and super down. Um, I couldn't eat after my jaw reconstructive surgery, so it was bittersweet because I could only have like water on a sponge because they were scared that my airways could get closed. Plus I had a trach in, so it was a lot of things that just was in the way of me eating. When you woke up, did you have a feeling like, were did you, were you into religion prior? And did you have yeah. like this awakening feeling where you felt like you were saved? I remember being in a body of water and seeing a cross, like it was like mountains and a cross. And I remember just walking, just walking through the water and looking at the light that was coming from the cross. And then I remember waking up and seeing my family and I was like, wow, wow, God really saved me. And the first thing I did after I woke up was read the Bible. And has wow. that continued to grow, like the, the spiritual side of everything? Is that one of the things that really helps you get through whenever you do kind of get down? Yeah. For Going sure. to God really helps me because God has a way with words. And when you read his teachings and what wisdom and knowledge he has, it's so powerful to want to take that in and live by it so you can live in a path of righteousness and a path of Christ rather than living for the world and loving materialistic things and not chasing the true high and the high of faith. And I don't know. I think just ever since getting out of the hospital and turning to God officially and really devoting my life to him, because back then I wasn't as devoted as I am now. Like back then I would go out to the clubs. I would go out and dance. I would go to festivals. Like I lived a really normal life and I lived a healthy life, but something just overtook me and things started to happen where I just felt like things weren't real and my reality kind of shifted. So we just, uh, I made a mistake and now I'm living with it. Did you write a letter or did you try to like, do things for certain loved ones, knowing that you might have carried out your plan. I didn't. I was very selfish when I did do it. I did not write letters. I wasn't thinking of anyone other it than myself that night. Moment, right? For you, yeah. it was like very quick that this happened. Yeah. Yeah, I paced around the house for a long time. Uh, I was actually gonna ask my boyfriend to like. I was gonna ask him, "Hey, can you like?" take my life for me because I'm too scared to do it myself. But I was like, no, I don't want to ask him that because he's going to know something's wrong. So I just hit it the whole time, the whole entire night. 
I just paced around the house with these suicidal thoughts that were just non-stop intrusive and they just wouldn't go away. So I found the gun and I loaded it with one bullet and I took the shot. And I was slowly pressing the trigger down and then the gun went off. So I didn't fully press the trigger down. It just, the firearm just reacted off of that one sensitive touch. Have you ever had a gun in your hand prior? Do you know about guns? Yeah, I do. Like I used to go to the, um, I used to go to the gun range sometimes and shoot that exact same gun actually. So it's kind of scary to know the power that it had. Like I knew the power that it had because the first time I shot that gun at the gun range, I was like, whoa, like that, that was scary. That was like a big explosion in my hand. I'm so little, I only weigh like 120 pounds. So guns aren't safe to me. So I try to stay away from them as much as possible now. That, that's actually what I was wondering if you still own one or not because it uh, I feel like you at, at least as of right now have it have become more comfortable at least with what happened so it, it could be 50 50 I guess I don't own any gun not anymore was it your gun or was it someone else's because someone it was like were you, gun. did uh, the cops question that yeah. They only asked him if, they, if he wanted to keep the gun or not, so he said, no, just take it. You can take the gun away. I don't want it in the house. Did uh, you feel violated? You probably felt violated by bit, them yeah. reading your journal, right? Yeah. Which I guess it makes sense that they had to because they have to inspect everything, but still, like, I feel like there could be a, a, I don't know, a line drawn somewhere there. What now do you tell people to do in that moment, that same very moment that you were facing, what do you recommend people to do if they're hearing voices or having those thoughts? Try to find a different outlook quick before you make a sudden mistake. Um, um, I know for me personally, I wish I would have just thought about it more rather than being so indecisive. Uh, I want people to know that it's important to think of others when you are having suicidal thoughts because as you think of others, there's other people out in this world that are willing and able to help you. So instead of being so selfish and not selfish because suicidal thoughts aren't making people selfish, but to be in a suicidal thought, it's very important to think of others and think of what you have in your life rather than trying to take your life away. And I feel like a lot of people talk about the fact that after everything, whenever it, it does fail, they instantly regret it almost. Like yeah. right away, they, they feel like, okay, I, I didn't want to do this. And now you have to just live with whatever happened. Because when you're in that moment and you struggle with mental health issues, like I have been there before, my friend. And I, I know that my mental health is something that I'm always going to have to work on. If Same with you. Like if you don't stop pouring into yourself and making you feel good and healing with certain traumas, you're always yeah. going to feel broken. Yeah. I agree with you. Do you get like self-conscious or, or anything about it just because you are still having work done and everything? I, I, I feel like in some ways it adds like an uplifting side because you have that story behind you and you have that confidence now. But I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who are just jackasses about it. Which well, there is a lot of people that have been cruel and hateful. Um, I've tried my very best. Sorry, those are my dogs. I've tried my very best to ignore all the hate comments and ignore anything that I do see that I don't like. Um, it's not hard to do. It's just like a swipe away and it's gone. Um, I usually don't respond to those hate comments. Uh, my confidence comes from God, really. Um, being able to express myself and knowing that I can live in God's image now and live for God rather than turning away from Him and living for the world. Because the world is Satan's world and, you know, He roams the earth. So it's very important for us to know who God is and what God's about and really follow His path. Do you make yourself accessible to help others is your inbox always open like yeah. i've i've been on your lives before so i know that you like to advocate for mental health that's one of the reasons yeah. why i wanted to hear your story yeah. because you know what so many people can relate to that struggle were you diagnosed with anything else besides depression because you were hearing those voices 
Yeah, I was uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. Yeah. Okay. And after all this, and it's been, you know, obviously leveled out and everything, where do you still feel like you have like a lot of growing that you need to do? Or do you feel like you're at that stable state? Uh, I feel like there's so much more growth that can come in life. So I don't ever want to just stop at one certain point in my life and become complacent with where I'm at. I like to go above and beyond and go to the extreme to achieve the things that I want to get in this life. So it's very important for me to still grow as a suicide survivor and know that I'm a suicide survivor and help others become not a suicide survivor, help others not take their lives. So that's what I want to try and advocate. I want to advocate that the importance of life and the gifts of life that we get from God. I want to just share that with the world. We do have a sponsor today. I want to go ahead and talk about that. It is going to be Betty with her life coaching services. So if you guys have watched the last few lives, you've seen Betty. Um, Betty is absolutely amazing. Marie utilizes her. I honestly need to, and I'm just busy all the time, so I don't. But Marie even said like she has been in therapy for nine years and she got so much more out of one session with Betty than therapy, like it was crazy. So she, she sings her praises highly. What you need to do is text her uh, Pod Talks. Just text her the name Pod Talks and you will get your very first session for free thank you for listening to the sponsor and now back to the episode i mean i feel like a lot of people especially in our space um just because it is for me and marie it's a recovery space a lot of times so a lot of people that are in that space have had some serious mental health struggles and have been exactly where you are or are currently in that place and they don't know what to do so that's again that's why we wanted you on just because it shows that afterwards i guess there is light and there is, there are people that care about you because I, I think that's what goes through a lot of people's head like no one would miss me and that's just not true have your relationships with your family like your parents and even your boyfriend strengthened since this yes i would say me and my boyfriend's relationship has strengthened tenfold because uh, the thought of losing each other and not having each other in our lives put a scare that comes from like a deep scare. So I think that I've gotten closer with everyone that I associate with in my family. I feel like uh, we have grown this bond of love and faithfulness and so much caring that's involved because they don't want to lose their baby girl because I'm the baby of four, I'm the youngest out of all my uh, sisters and brothers. So they're just scared that there might be a second time where I try to attempt and they don't want that to happen. Does schizophrenia run in your family? Because I know it's a genetic thing. Uh, I wouldn't say it does. Um, I don't really know. I've never seen or heard that my parents were hearing things. I never grew up like knowing like, hey, my mom's hearing things. Like that's never been something that I heard growing up. So I don't know where I get schizophrenia from or where the voices come from, but they're just random at the most random times of the day. And they're the weirdest things that are said. So I don't know what it is or why it happened to me, but I'm trying to learn to live with it. Did, uh, how was like learning to talk and eat and all that? Did, did you have a very big learning curve or was it pretty much normalized? <laughs> I did. I had a really good learning curve. Uh, it took me a long time to start to eat again because I had a G-tube in. So the G-tube was all liquids and it was straight to my stomach. And I was, I had a G-tube in for almost a year. Um, I could only eat little things and I still only eat little things. I have to break them up into little pieces so I can like fit it into my mouth and chew it properly. Um, chewing was a little weird because not having this part of your jaw just felt weird trying to chew like it just didn't feel right it felt like something was missing and like food and water would come out when i would try to eat so it just wasn't time to eat yet because i wasn't at those stages of recovery where i could take a bite of something and be okay with it but i had to learn how to walk again on top of learning how to eat and drink properly again 
because my surgery, they took bone from my tibia or my fibia, one of the two, but they took bone from my leg and they used it to reconstruct this part of my jaw. Um, and it took me like at least six weeks to learn how to properly walk straight in a line without falling over, without wobbling. Go ahead. Rick. Wow. How long was your surgery? Because I know that a surgery like that, especially in the beginning, had to take a long time. Yep. Uh, I want to say it was about 12 hours. Wow. I was in there for a long time. Uh, I woke up in a panic because I had a trach back in, so it was hard to breathe. Um, everything hurt. My face was so swollen, so it just didn't feel right. Whenever they took the, the bone and everything, can you, like, walk and run and do everything now? Like, is it healed, or is it just... <laughs> healed now it's just like sometimes they get shooting pains in my legs or sometimes they get like pressure in that one spot where the bones missing but I just kind of shrug it off and ignore it and just keep kind of going on about my day I think your gratitude for life is it that's what helps you to, to push the pain to the back yeah besides TikTok, what all do you do for trying to spread the the unaliving awareness and mental health awareness well i only do it on TikTok because the way TikTok works the traction uh the traction and the followers and the engagement and the algorithm that's on TikTok is very good so i feel like spreading this message of mental health and the awareness of mental health uh, it'll get a lot of like viewers on social media, especially TikTok, because people need to hear it. Um, I also started a clothing business. I'm actually wearing one of my shirts that says Mind Over Matter. It's called Rise Above Apparel, and so far I got 16 sales, and I'm doing pretty good. Um, this is to bring awareness to mental health and just spread positive messages to enforce a peaceful life on others rather than a chaotic mind and a chaotic spirit. I love that. That's beautifully said. What do you want to do? Like, is it is there some goal? Like, do you want to do public speaking and stuff like that? Or is are you content with this? I would like to speak for schools and really grasp the kids' mind now rather than them just scrolling on TikTok and seeing one girl who looks a little different and saying, oh, what happened to her? And not really taking it in. So I just want to be able to spread my message to anyone who's willing to listen and really take advantage of the story that I do have now and run with it and use it as a way for others to heal from things that they don't talk about. Wanting to help kids and speak at schools and stuff like that, that's huge because kids now are so desensitized to so much just because they're exposed to so much through social media and all that. So it's, I, I feel like that is probably one of the most important things anyone can do because mental health is just a train wreck for so many young people right now even older people too but like the kids are big how is your hearing did that affect your hearing because i've always heard people say that when they've shot a gun they it's like they heard like a loud ringing in their ears uh when it first went off um it sounded like a bomb had just went off like the you know when a bomb goes off on like call of duty or like in a movie and the ringing sound that comes from the uh, the troops right ears? yeah that's what it sounded like it was just constant ringing and i was like dazed and confused and like wobbly i wasn't like all there and like my right state of mind obviously not so the ringing just hurt so bad and the way my head got knocked back from the impact of the gun it was so strong it like tore a muscle in my neck for like wow. days i was just oh for days i was just laying in the hospital bed just like turning my head and i just had this pinched nerve that just wouldn't go away so were you in a trauma unit obviously did they have to take you to a special hospital I was in the ICU. I was at a, a hospital called Halifax Hospital here in Daytona. Um, it's a, not too bad of a hospital. Uh, we had our issues with them because they let a lot of things happen to me that shouldn't have happened to other patients. Like I, like I got a bald spot on the back of my head because they didn't rotate me the proper way and they just let me sit there rather than rotating me or giving me a donut pillow. Right. I was in the, yeah, I was in the ICU for about two weeks. 
and then I got put to stable condition, and then they moved me to the psychiatric facility so they could start running diagnosis and test on me to see what was causing me to have those two subtle thoughts, the voices, and the kind of messed up reality. Do you have a safety plan now, especially with your loved ones? Like, if I'm feeling this type of way, like, let's, or if you recognize these things in me. I wouldn't say I have, like, a solid safety plan. I just know how to deal with things more often. The medicine that I do take is very, very beneficial to me. It helps so much. Um, it's al Alify and Mortazapine. I don't know if you guys heard of them before. But they're really good, and um, my safety plan is just making sure that my mind stays at the most peace that it can be. So, like, if I get, if I start to hear things, I'll listen to music rather than listen to the voices. Um, I'll talk to Aiden, and me and Aiden will go do something fun to get my mind off of things. So I don't have, like, this steady safety plan but i do have a idea you have tools now you have tools in your toolbox that you could pull out when you need them now yeah with all this are there things that you don't do just because you feel like it could be a trigger obviously i'm sure handling weapons and stuff is one but is there anything else i don't smoke anymore i used to smoke a lot um i would smoke at least two once a day sometimes um this was back when I wasn't in the bad state of mind. Um, and then once I started hearing things, that's when I cut back on the smoking because I knew that was just affecting my ability to just think right and think straight. So I've been done smoking for about a year and six months now. Um, it's been good because my doctors think that the smoking is causing the voices. So that's why I put a stop to everything. That is super, super interesting. Was there anything else like that you would regularly take or did you drink on top of it a lot or? I would drink occasionally. I wasn't a big drinker and I'm still not a big drinker. I don't like the way it makes me feel. Like I just get sloppy off of it and I'm not a sloppy person. I like to be like upright and straightforward. So I don't drink often. Um, when I did, I wouldn't hear things. So the alcohol wasn't suppressing any thoughts in my mind or the voices, but I don't do anything else. I just, I used to smoke, but I don't smoke anymore. And I drink on occasion, but it's rare. Do you, you wear wigs, right? Someone, yeah. someone had mentioned that. It's, is there, what's the reason for that? Is it just not, the hair doesn't grow in properly or? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I just like the wigs because they give me a new look. Uh, I like the way the bangs frame my face or I like the way a new color makes me yeah, like the verse, it's like you could be whoever you want that day, right? Like yeah, different literally. looks. It's nice. It's nice to just not have to, like I have pink hair now and I don't always like pink hair. So I like to have the wig to have an option. Do you like worry about your appearance as much? Is it more for you? Does that make sense? I feel like I'm not wording that right. Well, you're good. Uh, I do worry about my appearance. I know I don't look the same because I used to be gorgeous. So, so you I still are like, beautiful. I just want to let you know, seriously, I see such a beautiful person inside and outside. They reflect each other. Thank you. It's been hard to adjust to my new appearance. Uh, I get a lot of comments about it. Um, a lot of people say, you're pretty, you're gorgeous. And a lot of people say, I would try again if I looked like that. And it's just like, it hits deep because I'm like, wow, right. I wish I never tried this whole place. Like, you guys didn't know, understand what I was going through at that time. So, like, for you to call on something so ignorant, it's just, it says a lot about their character and about who they are as a person. So I try to just ignore the signs of hatred and, and I just pray for them. You have to have thick skin to post yeah. on TikTok yeah. because people yeah. will tear you down for anything, your voice, your hair, anything. How, how like close do the doctors think that they're going to get everything back to the way it was? Uh, they said like 95%. Wow, oh, that. So like now what are you facing surgery wise? Like, will you get implants or can you not get implants? Will you use a denture? How does that work? 
So I have to get bone placed behind here. So when your lower teeth sit, that bone that your lower teeth sit on, I don't have that anymore because the gun took it away. So they're gonna do, I don't know if they're gonna take bone from my leg or they're so gonna- artificially- An artificial, artificial bone. But right. I need bone here and able to get dental implants. I can get top ones fine because I still have my upper jaw and that bone that connects my teeth to my jaw and things like that. Like that didn't get affected at all. So I can get dental implants with the top with no issue. But the bottom, I need a new bone and they're gonna have to bring like blood vessels to connect certain nerves together. They were just talking about it and it just seemed super complicated, complicated. And it worried me a little bit because they're gonna have to go back in my mouth and I think for that surgery, for the bone part, they're gonna have to put the trach back in because they're working in my mouth and they don't wanna obstruct the airway. Right, it's, it's gonna be more complicated and that's a lot for you to mentally prepare for because all yeah. of these surgeries, you have to be in the right mental headspace to even do these surgeries. So I got to commend you, seriously. I appreciate that, Maria. I appreciate that a lot. I try very hard to stay strong and courageous the whole ordeal of surgeries and appointments that I do have. And like, if I get good or bad news, I try to just stay strong regardless of what the news is because I know- Do you have a lot <laughs> of appointments? Like, do you have a lot yeah. of medical appointments? Like this doctor, that one, is that what your life turned into? Yeah, I see a lot of doctors on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, like every four weeks, I see my psychiatric doctor for my medication refills and um, okay, just to I'm talk- home nurse for the longest Yeah, time. I had an at-home nurse for a very long time, uh, close uh, to a year. Uh, she would come and like, she would clean my stitches and she would make sure it's not infected. You had a PT um, guy. I had a PT guy, speech physical guy. therapy guy, speech therapy guy. I had a lot of doctors guy. in my life. Uh, so you had, so you had to like open, learn to open your door to all these people. Yeah, and, and sometimes that was hard that's hard. That's hard, that especially when you struggle with, with your mental health. Cause sometimes I'm like, I don't even want to see this person, right? That's how it felt for me. Like, I don't know you guys, and you guys are like intruding on, they're not intruding, but they were here to help me, but- Yeah, they're in your the way personal they, space. Yeah, you know, like I didn't have my personal space. I couldn't just relax and like look crazy as hell as I usually did back then. But now things are looking so much better and I'm doing so much better now. And I'm just happy about where my life is right now. What is the best thing you can say for anyone struggling with mental health like that number one thing that no matter what you feel like it helps i want people to remember that there is a light at the end of the tunnel regardless of how dark and scary things may feel at the time there is truly a light at the end of the tunnel because god never turns his back on us so god's light will always shine through us no matter what we do we just have to praise him enough and devote our time and our life to him to really learn to live the true way of light rather than live in darkness. What's your favorite new like experience? Obviously you're dealing with all these these doctors and nurses and all this stuff. What's what's your favorite thing that you didn't do before that you do now? Uh, I went scuba diving in Puerto Rico, which was uh, very, very cool. That was a new experience for me and me and my boyfriend got to share that experience. What type of work do you do? Cause I heard you say about work earlier. Uh, right now, I just own this clothing business, Rise Above Apparel, and I'm waiting on disability right now. So, because um, I still hear things and I still see things, right. so disability it's hard to work. It takes with. a long time to establish yeah. sometimes, and it's sad because it's like there are people like look, you look at the, where you had to get to to even have somebody listen to you and validate you. That's one thing that I feel like a lot of times happens. People don't validate other people's mental health struggles. Do you ever feel like you're not heard? Back then, before I shot myself, I didn't feel understood. I didn't feel right. heard. I didn't feel listened to. I didn't feel as loved as I feel now. Um, there were a lot of things going on in my personal life that just made me super sad and super lonely. So. I don't know. It was hard to adjust to like being so lonely and only having those thoughts that you had. It was kind of scary to be so alone and have those thoughts. But now I 
cherish every moment that I have with my significant other, and we really take the time to praise God and praise God for the life that I do have and the life that we have together. So, so now you I'm look not... forward to things, right? Like you, like before yeah. where you might not have looked forward to certain things, today you have that hope within yourself. Yeah, I have that hope within me that things will pan out for the right reasons and right. God will look away. I'm so grateful. I came across you one time. You go live a lot on TikTok. Do you have a schedule yeah. that you go live? No, I just go live random points of the day. I try to set my times up like once in the morning, once in the afternoon, uh, in the evening time. And if I'm up late at night, I'll sometimes go live, but normally I don't because I don't know who's up at two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you on. And it's it's just awesome to hear like the comeback and, and how it went from so bad to this and, and you're you're in a good place now. So yeah, congrats. That's that's awesome and nice work working on yourself. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, of course, you guys have a great day, okay? You too.